Okay, the second module that we're going to chat a little bit about is behavior. And this was quite difficult to, to choose a topic to speak about during this webinar, but I think I can safely say that our favorite one is replacing pep talks with prep talks. So if we think about behavior, often what happens if we have a child who engages in seemingly challenging behavior, we often tend to, the child we're, is busy with something, something happens that seems like a type of challenging behavior, whatever it may be, and then we react to the behavior with certain consequences. Now, the idea being there is, depending on the consequence, that behavior is going to increase or decrease. But working with quite a few children over quite a few years, we we have found that there are ways that are more effective. And for the child, it makes more sense. And it's also equipping our kids with tools to support them and, and for them to, to understand and to also really feel supported. So not only dealing with consequences over and over again, because then the behavior has already happened. Our child is already upset. Our, our child already doesn't have a, a suitable way to communicate with us, an effective way. So we want to change that. We want to give them the, the way that's easier for them, the way that makes them feel supported, and that really makes a positive difference for them. So if we look at replacing pep talks with prep talks, I might throw in one or two simple examples here so that it makes sense. And of course, you can go and read through the handouts in your own time. I'm not going to read through everything right now. So the most important thing here is prep talks is talks to prepare our children. And preparing our child for any upcoming change, as it says there, is key in reducing seemingly challenging behavior. So let's take a simple example. Let's say we're going um, on an outing with our child. We're going to take the bus and we'll go and have ice cream somewhere. That's something that they enjoy doing. So a pep talk or dealing with consequences might look like we're going to the bus stop we planned on getting on the bus, but now there's a long line and we're finding it really difficult to wait in the line. We're getting upset, uh, crying and screaming, perhaps everyone's staring at us and what now? So the behavior has already happened. We need to put a consequence in place, which is usually not very nice for us or our child, if let's face it. But taking the same scenario and doing a prep talk instead. So now we're going to prepare our child and we can use different things. As it says here, we can use social stories where we're gonna um, combine the next one figurine play. We can act out the little sceneries. Okay, this is me, this is you. We're walking to the bus stop. Oh, there's a long line at the bus stop. What can we do now? All right, we need to go and wait in the line. What can we do while we're waiting? Perhaps we can play as I spy. Perhaps we can play with some sensory toys. Perhaps we can count the cars going past. So we're starting to prepare our child. We might get to the bus stop and we need to wait, but that's okay. We've got our other ideas of things that we can do already. Things that's going to help us while we are waiting. Let's just see. Okay. Then something else that's important, okay, going to buy ice cream is probably not the most suitable example here, but anyway, research online about the outing. And if you can, involve your child in this research. It is often something that, especially some of our, the little bit older kids that they really enjoy doing. See where you're going, help them to, to start getting excited about it, but also we're preparing them what to expect a little bit maybe a little bit of how it's going to look like what they can expect when they get there do we need to is it a shop where we sit down and have ice cream do we just walk through buy our ice cream and walk out again little things we might be taking them for granted we might not even be thinking about them because sometimes for us it may seem irrelevant but for our kids those little things just being prepared, knowing what to expect can really make a massive difference. And then we'll get to the last point now. But now we've got a child who's going on an outing. We're going to the bus stop. 
if there is a line and we need to wait to buy our ticket or to get on the bus, we know what we're going to do. We can write down our, our notes as we prepare for the outing and write down our ideas, have some visuals to support us, a checklist perhaps, and we can deal with this because we practiced it. We did our little role play situations. If the bus is there right on time, great. If it's not, it's not an issue because we know what we're going to do now. We are prepared for it. And that is what makes the real big difference for us and for our children, really. And then just the last point, when we're going on the outing, it is always a good idea to take photos in between, take photos of the place where you're going, take photos of your child on the outing, perhaps the two of you together or whoever's doing the outing with your child. These are memories that you can speak about later. Tomorrow you can print out these photos or flick through them on your phone. Speak about these things, point out little things. Do you remember when we went to get ice cream and what happened? And what did it taste like? What did you like? It's a perfect way to increase communication again and just share those little moments along the way. So an outing can be stressful sometimes, but if we are prepared and our child is prepared, it's really going to help both of us. And then try and whenever you can take some photos to refer back to after the outing as well. Here's a little template. I'm not going to go through this, but this is something that you can use with your child whenever it's possible. I'll say this over and over again, but with anything that we discuss, we want our kids to be part of the planning, part of the preparation whenever and wherever it's possible. So this is a, a little template that you can use. Use it with your child, write down, draw, um, print and paste pictures. And then also you can use the bottom part as a reminder of things that I need to take to the outing. I didn't really cover that, but that's part of preparing them. We're going to the bus stop. Tomorrow is our outing. We're going to buy ice cream. What do we need? Oh, I need to take my backpack. I need to make sure I've got some sensory toys in there or a sensory backpack. That, that's also always a good option. Um, what else? We might need a hat for the sun. If we're going to walk for some way, do we need sunscreen, a drink bottle? And don't just give your child the list of things to write out or just um, write them out yourself. Try and encourage them to think of it. Okay, we might walk a little bit of the way. We might wait in the sun. What do you think we might need? And help them to prompt them to, to, to think about things like my drink bottle, my backpack. How are we going to buy the ice cream? We need to take money. And that's part of teaching them the thought processes behind these outings that can seem simple, but they're really not. Then on the day of the outing, now we've prepared already, we've practiced these scenarios a few times, and we're ready for this outing. Take a few deep breaths again with your child to make sure everyone's calm and organized, even though they're excited, and then go through some basic rules again. All right, so let's look at our checklist. Have we got everything? We've got our backpack, check that off. We've got our water and help our child to go through the list with us. Remember with everything that we do, our, our child might still be young now, but we are already fostering those skills of independence later. We don't want to always be the one responsible for making checklists before we go on an outing. We want our child as they get older to start learning those things, doing those things themselves. That's again, practical, it's functional, it's effective for our kids. Um, take photos on the, of the outing because we wanna speak about it later. Keep calm, that's for you and for your child. And remember when we need sensory or movement breaks in between, we just do that. That brings me to another point. Make sure that if your child is communicating through perhaps visual cue cards, you need to take it along on the outing. Make sure that it's always accessible so that they can let you know, I've had enough, I need a break. All right, let's take a break. Let's reset our focus. Let's do some slow, deep breathing so that we can be ready to move on. We don't want them to be overwhelmed. It's an outing that we want them to have fun as well. 
Okay, and then this is a little outing diary again that you can use with your child, pasting some photos there or drawing a picture of something on the outing that they did. And then also, whenever you can do this with your child, help them to think about the things that what they really did well in during the outing or things that they really enjoyed. And then is there anything they can think of that they need a little practice in? Perhaps the bus took a little bit longer than they were hoping for and they got impatient and they were struggling to, to wait for the bus until it got there. What can I do next time? Perhaps I need to take another fiddle toy. Perhaps the one that I chose wasn't the best one for waiting in the sun. And then planning your next outing. It might not be today or the next day, but where do I want to go next? When will we go? Start researching about that again, because it's not only the planning, but it's those sharing those moments and communication, communication throughout. And this provides the perfect opportunity for communication for our kids too. All right, Carla, behavior questions. Thank you so much for all the questions. I think um, the list is getting quite long now and Sarai is helping. So she is an autistic adult and she's one of our good friends and our advisors at Ames Global. So she's also helping in between. Um, if I don't get to everything, we're going to, we're going to do some live Q and A's at the end as well. Um, just a few that I wrote down, there were quite a few um, speaking of behavior, which is great. There are quite a few older kids that are struggling with behavior. And what I do want to mention here is that it's extremely important to work on the self-regulation from such a young age, from as young as you can. And just giving your child those ideas on how to ask for breaks again, how to regulate themselves, how to even just be aware of their feelings and how they're, um, what they're feeling and how to then calm themselves. But if your child's a little bit older, that just means that if I'm, I'm seeing quite a few questions, there's one of an eight year old that's quite impulsive, a 14 year old with a lot of tantrums. And then there's some uh, three year old that is not potty trained, but uh, the three year olds got a lot of breakdowns and Sarai answered there uh, with a very nice, um, answer saying that you know she also didn't like the touch um the the feeling of pulling something up like pull-ups but if i go if i skip ahead because um we are trying to cover as much as possible here but if i skip ahead to the eight-year-olds and the 14-year-olds that are struggling with behavior first of all it is a very difficult thing for parents and we know this as professionals because a lot of professionals will tell you you need to do 40 hours of therapy you need to do speech therapy you need to do ot and because we we can see it from both sides now we've decided okay why don't we take in what the professionals are saying but we have to empower the parents again and tell them you know what is best for your child so even if you're getting all these suggestions you are still the true expert of your child so it might be that your child is overwhelmed just like you might be overwhelmed too um, we do get that often where there, there are so many different types of therapies that the children need to go to that it's not just overwhelming for the child, but for the parents too. And at that stage, um, I will tell you a little bit of a personal story. I'm going to try and not take too much time, but I was in Singapore working with a young child and we were going from one therapy to another while we're eating lunch in the car and I was getting overwhelmed and I phoned Nanette and this is actually how AIMS, the live-in therapy started because I phoned Annette and I said, look, I'm overwhelmed. I, I don't even have time to quickly run to the toilet. What do I do? And she said, tell the parents to stop all therapies. I'm like, oh, thanks, Nanette. This is wonderful news. I don't think the parents are going to be so happy with me, but they did trust us. So our plan was to stop therapy and then slowly build on therapy again. So we started with two weeks, we started with two weeks of doing nothing and just building that rapport with the child, with that child again, even though he liked me, you know, I was still seen as a therapist. So we decided, okay, we're going to slowly reintroduce him to, to us being his friend 
and a confidant and saying, okay, let's take it easy and see where are the basics that he's missing? What, what basics does he miss? He's not out, able to self-regulate because he was always overwhelmed. So we need to work on the skills that we're talking about now. And, and that is really to get to know his own sensory system and understanding when he needs to take a break. And that lasted for, it started with two weeks, but it lasted up, up until three months, I think. And then we slowly introduced again, occupational therapy. And our live-in therapist was there because, you know, it's interest-based. So he really enjoyed her being his best friend, really. And the occupational therapy was really good for that sensory profile of his. And then we slowly introduce speech therapy once a week and we generalize that at home. And if you're not able to have a live-in therapist, this is why we're focusing so much on parent training because we know that you are able to do this uh, even if it's just generalization of this at home um, because it's, it's unsustainable to have therapy for five years and the cost of it is too much as well. So we know this and we want to train parents and or pairs and, you know, anyone that can help, maybe a grandma can help um, and, and, then, and then go from there. But I think we are going to answer more of these questions at the end, but I don't want to take too much of Nanette's time because I do have a habit of doing that. So Nanette, over to you. Thanks for all the questions.